Well, welcome to the Grace Hub. Glad to see you guys here this evening. I made a management decision. Pastors do a lot of that. But I figured, well, I know you guys aren't rebel rousers, but I'm sure most people will be having some kind of fun on New Year's Eve and really don't want to go to church at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, hence we're having a little Vesper service in celebration of the first Sunday of Christmas. What I loved about these texts this week uh, is that it really does speak to the meaning and identity of family. Here we have the prophecy of Isaiah complete, essentially, in today's gospel. The shoot of Jesse sprung, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, God with us, Jesus the tree of life, is only hoping we would be and become the branches of his body in the world for his gospel's sake. Essentially, we are to be and become the children of grace and promise. There is this one image, I still love it, uh, that I have appreciated from my days of studying Stephen's ministry at the beginning of my, my uh, faith journey, a renewed faith journey, con post-conversion. This image is of considering Christ as that great tree. Basically, uh, in regards to Stephen's ministry, the Stephen's minister would be holding on to the branch of Christ and reaching down to those in the pit. But what I was seeing here in thinking of these texts is he is the great tree on top of that hill with loving branches reaching down just near the edge to that valley, the one you are reaching out from, and efforts to grab hold of and pull you out of that pit. The task of reaching in many ways is the same as our response, our, our loving and gracious response to a loving and gracious God. Often, though, the task of reaching, uh, our seeking God's hands and guidance and rule in our lives is challenging. We may be feeling as if we're reaching out from that valley and are not able to grasp hold be rescued from our circumstances or the very present evil that is all around us at many times. It is a sad element of coming to understand why does evil happen? The big fancy, uh, well, not $20 word, I'd say $15 word is theodicy, the problem of understanding evil in the world. Why does God allow it? The great existential, that's the $20 word, question that Job, the, uh, Job, the book of Job, he wrestled with and that we still wrestle with in our very daily lives, in our faith journeys, as his disciples, disciples of Jesus, still goes on, unresolved, basically. The rulers of this world, such as Herod in today's gospel, think in terms of destruction and chaos. It's important to realize that the human inclination to sin, to do evil, often begins with that element of fear, that fear-mongering, which then couples and embraces greed, as well as is rationalized through and carried out by our grave sin of indifference. And you have probably heard from other sermons of mine, I think I really believe that greed and indifference are like the substructure to all sin, the great grave sins that are behind all other sins. There is no meaning for them to the concept of preservation or restoration. They would rather grow in the wilderness, Herod and other people like that, under their own control. I mean, it's all about control, that there's the greed factor. This wilderness of graceless behavior is nothing less than an empty promise, also known as the reality of hell. For Herod, hell, the hell he would create, is the slaughter of the innocents. Well, we've been seeing enough on TV of different things going on in Syria and other places. In Herod's sick and twisted mind, the massacre of hundreds of infants would preserve his political machine. 
and thus control, he thought, the Messiah's return, you know, to kind of snuff out the king of the Jews that the, the Magi were um, inferring to. In today's gospel, uh, gospel, we hear of the Magi, who have been historically speculated, though I had a nice, uh, interesting Facebook debate on this, but it, hey, you know, I went to an evangelical seminary and we really looked at different things. But it is speculated that honestly there may have been between 50 to poss 15 to possibly 30 travelers. But only the three we hear about. Which, you know, you have to take into account that three is an important symbol. You know, the symbol of the Trinity and of harmony and uh, many other things. So we only hear about the three in the gospel. Their importance is fairly significant, and we will even acknowledge that further uh, this coming week with the celebration of uh, Epiphany, the Epiphany of our Lord. The Magi were basically instrumental in helping to save the Holy Family. They saved them in this week's gospel. They knew the treacherous heart of Herod was seeking to murder a possible rival. You know, that's how nuts he was. <laughs> it's an infant, <laughs> you know, but he, he is just like he couldn't deal with anything that could be in his way. But they outwitted him. You know, he wasn't that bright. Uh, as we know, however, the cost was very great, if not dire, and as uh, the texts speak of, you know, many mothers and families in the region of Bethlehem, the symbol of Rachel, uh, the voice and persona of her crying out in agony and lamenting, she would never be truly consoled. They would never be truly consoled. Currently these days, it's hard not to keep your eyes and ears away from the news, especially in regards to hearing about the ancient land of Israel. Part of this, I have to say, this whole entire week, um, my visiting angels hospice care I've been doing, I've been watching uh, a lot of news stations all day long. So <laughs> I've been probably o o ODing on being informed on the news. There is now a complex divide in regards to what's going on in Israel and an ongoing war that has yet to find peace between many different parties. All of these parties ironically come from different rootage, but are a part of a much greater family. This would be the peoples of Palestine, the peoples and descendants of the original chosen people, the Israelites, or in the common understanding today, Israelis. Like their ancient ancestors, they have been trying to come home. From an exile of circumstances that human frailties throughout history have created a complex web they still feel in bondage to. There are many countries who have invested interest in putting their politically stained hands, if you will, that expression, politically stained hands of control upon the already weighted shoulders. Can you imagine what they're feeling? The weighted shoulders of a people who have not found real peace in something like 5,000 plus years. These are the people who have still not seen or realized to their understanding that the Messiah has come in Christ Jesus the Lord, our faith. How could they really have much hope to go on? How could they feel genuinely encouraged? I think that their courage is challenged. Their faith and resolve is challenged, especially with so many people interfering for other reasons and agendas, which really have nothing to do with reclaiming with what they have called home. We know from the metaphor of simple gardening again. Yes, I, I talk about gardening a lot because I'm so bad at it. <laughs> I'm bad at real gardening, but not spiritual gardening. Gardening. That if you don't successfully root or plant a tree into the ground, 
it will wither and die. And I get a lot of this from my friend Yurik, who has now become an expert uh, gardener. He has helped to plant and replant many a tree at uh, Bethany UCC that he has been working at. Jesus is the root of our lives. And his holy patronage and human roots are planted now in the town of Nazareth. It is here that he would be known as the Nazarene, where his family would return to once they came back from Egypt upon Herod's death. I read some commentaries uh, for this Sunday where they talked about or considered Jesus and the Holy Family to be refugees. I would go a step further and say we are all refugees spiritually, in a spiritual sense, when it comes to how we are growing as children of grace and promise, that we are to be and become upon our Father's commissioning, also known as our baptism. Living into your baptism. I know you've heard in many a sermon, and I have preached the concept of being and becoming children of grace and promise. There's two aspects that you will always see in the New Testament hearken to, and that is the majesty and magnificence of the reality of grace, as well as the spiritual challenge and hope of promise. The word promise may be something we have a hard time leaning upon or feeling hopeful for. We are frail human beings, okay? You know, it's hard. I promise. You know, when, when it's kind of coming from that human sense of understanding, you're like, well, you know, that, that challenges us. Promise beckons our trust and our capacity to hope specifically beyond ourselves. It is our gracious and faithful affirmation of trusting in God and His sovereign purposes for our lives. Think of the wonderful lyrics for a moment from Handel's Messiah. I remember singing uh, this with the choir um, at the beginning of my journey, actually, with um, Carter Westminster United Presbyterian Church when I was their church secretary, but I loved to sing, and they invited me to sing in the choir. For unto us a child is born, a savior and a king, just acknowledging the joy, with the joy and the thanksgiving, through our faith, the hope of the Messiah entering our world, a God who indeed came down to us, gives us our identity and grounds us, and plants us within, plants within us, into that good soil of grace, the seed of the new creation. One of the educational notes I have to share from assisting once in a blessing of a congregant's home was that incorporating the name of Jesus, especially saying Jesus of Nazareth, helps not only to bless the home, but to cleanse the home, to make it safe against evil. It actually, it acts like a, a hedge, as my, my one friend who does a lot of house blessings, is it's like a hedge against evil to say Jesus of Nazareth, that the people who are evil or evil spirits are threatened by that. That's pretty wild, isn't it? As St. Paul said in that beautiful hymn from his letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love that. This creedal hymn encourages our lives to cling to that promise. God is with us. Just like those leaves upon those branches to the body of that tree of life that is Jesus. Isaiah, as we have come to know from many a study and uh, many a hearing, had the clearest prophecy of the coming hope and the journey of the Messiah, the suffering uh, servant. We've heard that at Lent and etc. This is something we've needed to hear, we've needed to cherish. 
For thousands of years, the chosen people may have felt or thought to be chosen, but never felt like they were really allowed to come home. In many senses, they are still refugees with, uh, within what should be their home, Israel. We have heard from the beautiful poetry of many of an Isaiah text, the challenge of living through the exile and coming home. And as disciples of Jesus, we have dealt with the challenges of another kind of exile. This is a spiritual exile. As our lives journey to respond to God's grace as his children. This very first Sunday within the season of Christmas is to teach our hearts the true meaning of Christmas. No, it's not Santa or Rudolph. Christ Jesus gives us our identity and in a very real sense, home, the sense of home. He gives us our hope and is God's promise here and now with us. We should never feel lost or in bondage. We are made prisoner only to the evil one's empty promises and temptations upon us to lure us into a willful exile away from God and any real genuine hope we could have for righteousness and peace. You know, Satan works very well. I was counseling a young woman just the other day, uh, and she is losing her faith and losing her hope. And, you know, I, God is, uh, Satan is definitely working on her to make her not feel encouraged but to, to despair. Making those New Year's resolutions, why not start with the journey of peace by reconciling with God? Uh, begin to tend to that spiritual garden to reap that new nature seed, to rebirth, to have a renewal, have a rebirth. Be the gift of peace to love God and neighbor, unite the world, grow love. There is a lot of uncertainty and fear thick in the air these days. I mean, I watched eight hours of news every day this week, you know, Monday through Friday, hearing everything. The life of the Christian is not an easy road, yet alone makes sense to our human rationalizations. But... We must carry on. We must stay encouraged to persevere to carry on. The faith of Joseph to realize God's voice in a dream rescuing him, Mary, and the infant Jesus is a wonderful testimony of faith in action. We will realize our true role in the family of God. Once we put our faith and trust in God's work, active throughout our everyday lives. I mean, God is doing little things, even things we can't even imagine or don't even pay attention to that are helping to shape us. God with us and his new nature promise is planted for us to merely reap. Reaping is that gracious response. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once we realize our task of growing with your holy word and will, we will reap with joy that new-natured seed planted within our hearts to establish our adoption as your sons and daughters, truly the children of grace and promise. It is true we are refugees in our journeys to loving you and neighbor. Help us to escape from our spiritual exile and return to our true home, trusting in your love and mercy to always guide us. In your most precious and holy name we pray. Amen.